Buenos días, jóvenes. Buenos días. Buenos días. Buenos días. Ya tenemos con nosotros a nuestro conferencista. Les pido, por favor, a los alumnos del taller que pongan sus imágenes de fondo. Les pido a todos que, por favor, apaguen sus micrófonos. Ya estamos grabando esta sesión, tanto para nosotros como la gente que quiera consultarlo después de la sesión. Voy a repetir esto un par de anuncios mientras va entrando toda la gente. Bien, jóvenes, otra vez los anuncios. Por favor, eh, a los alumnos del taller, sus imágenes de fondo, eh, sus cámaras prendidas. Ya está con nosotros nuestro conferencista. Yo lo voy a introducir. Eh, y... Les pido, por favor, que tengan sus micrófonos apagados, excepto cuando estemos en la eh, sesión de preguntas y respuestas, claramente al final. Esta sesión ya está siendo grabada para quien la quiera consultar al acabar o quienes no hayan podido ingresar junto con nosotros. Bien, voy a, presentar, eh, voy a dar a presentar a nuestro conferencista para el día de hoy. Eh, voy a leer su pequeña biografía. Eh, Franz, it's great to have you here. I'm going to read a small bio of yours, and then you can uh, properly say hello to all of our students. Uh, the MVRDB studio class has joined us here. You might be able to recognize them by their profile photo. They have their case studies there. And then, of course, The rest of the um, faculty and student members of UDEM that wanted to join in for your presentation are also here with us. Um, it is a pleasure for us to be here today with uh, MVRDB partner Franz De Witt. I'm going to read a small bio. Uh, Franz De Witt has graduated from 1973 in Rotterdam. He joined MVRDB in 1996. Before joining the company, he briefly worked at JP Van Esteren Contractors. Uh, he is currently leading projects in the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, and the USA, and also another project that France might tell us at the end of this, this lecture, which might be a surprise, among which uh, 110,000 square meters of renovation of the Parisian Legate shopping center and the Pullman Hotel and the soon to open Crystal Houses flagship store in Amsterdam. Franz is greatly experienced in construction projects and has executed many buildings within time and budget, which is very important. Uh, he has participated in MBRD projects such as the Stigeldam housing, uh, the glass farm, and the balancing barn, and the sky vault penthouse in New York. Uh, without further ado, it is a pleasure to welcome Franz David. Welcome, Franz. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's actually very nice to see all this um, Uh, photos in the back of, uh, of, of your students. Uh, I see actually some, there are some projects that I will uh, discuss uh, briefly um, in my lecture that I have uh, some of my, um, uh, at the project I will discuss a little bit larger in a larger form. Some of them I only uh, discuss in like three, three slides or two slides even. Uh, I actually also see a, a project that I'm not going to discuss, but it's, it's nice to see uh, the, Uh, the the I-beam project that uh, is behind Anna, uh, one of my one of my projects in New York, that the, the first project in the United States that I worked on. Sadly, I didn't build it, but it's uh, it's nice to see that it's uh, that you're still that you're looking at it and that you're working on it. Um, so, let, so I will start sharing my uh, screen. So you all see my uh, my screen now? Yes, we see the MVRDV cover, Franz. Perfect. Perfect. So MVRDV, um, let me first do a quick introduction on MVRDV. Who is MVRDV? Um, we are a creative and social, uh, innovative and realistic, uh, green, remarkable architecture firm. And, also our, and we're trying to make the world better with our buildings. Um, 
of course, I'm not alone. This is so here, here in the front, you see MVRDV. Uh, so that's uh, the, the three founding partners, Winnie Maas, Natalie de Vries and Jacob van Rijs. And behind them, you see the management team where I'm uh, one of them. Uh, we work from uh, our four offices. We have an office in Rotterdam, in Paris, in Berlin, and in Shanghai. Um, and from these four offices, we uh, try to work all over the world. Uh, and what um, Viviana was just saying, uh, hopefully uh, uh, that we also will be uh, soon be working in uh, Mexico. Um, uh, and then uh, that, that can actually then also lead maybe that I, uh, at a certain moment, can visit your studio. Uh, we do this with 270 employees, uh, most of them in Rotterdam uh, and the rest in the other offices that I just showed you. And we work, uh, of course, uh, the, the top one the part is uh, you understand architecture, urbanism uh, in the interior. These are the things that we, uh, that's our core business. But you see as an architect that, that, our, that core business actually uh, is expanding and is, is changing. So teaching uh, is a very vital part, but also uh, BIM, scripting, uh, research and materials, and exhibition, that all, also these are an integral part of our office and uh, in, in how we work and what we do. So this, the, 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 the teaching that we are doing uh, leads to new, uh, new insights. The scripting that we are doing, uh, uh, we use in the different buildings and in, uh, in, in construction methods. Um, and that, that all of this is that, of course, uh, we're trying to publish, but also uh, to uh, show in buildings and exhibitions. Um, we work on the global issues. Um, um, so we work around the world, uh, but we always try to be um, very pragmatical, but also local. Uh, we always work together with a local architect. If we're working in another country, we will always use local knowledge uh, to uh, stimulate us, but also to help us um, uh, to realize our projects. Uh, sustainability is one of our uh, main goals that we're working on. Our ambition is to become 100% uh, sustainable in our design and production. Um, we're not there. We're, uh, the, our whole industry is not there yet and we are far from it, but we're trying and we're really um, uh, uh, teaching our people uh, how to do, become better, how to do this. And uh, we also have experts in our office that are actually um, only working on these kind of um, questions. Um, we do research, what I said, we do research uh, exhibition and installations uh, where we show here a couple of them. And of course we do architecture. Uh, if you look at the, two seconds, I'm trying to get rid of, uh, there's a bar on my screen. Oh, yeah, um, we will, of course, work on transformations, private houses, um, interiors, uh, residential offices, and for now, to, to, today, the most important is a cultural and public. But if you look at, uh, or if you look at the question that is there, what is cultural? Um, a cultural building, of course, maybe that's clear, but what is cultural? Cultural, of course, it means from the people, it means where do you come from, where, where do you... Uh, what do you bring with you and what do you bring in your interest? So I thought it, was, is, it is maybe interesting to first start with the MVRDV office, because that's actually where MVRDV works, where MVRDV is, and where also we create our ideas. We're, we're based in an uh, old building in Rotterdam. It's uh, designed uh, just before the Second World War, uh, built just after, and we have this five white sheds that you see in the middle of the building. We occupy this. Uh, we moved in about uh, uh, six years ago. When we moved in, it was uh, being occupied by another uh, company, and they, yeah, they they just put it full of little rooms. So the first thing we did, actually did is we renovated it. We took out most of the uh, the rooms and divided the, the the building in three parts. So we have say the the white room. That's the the working space where where. Is one big open space where we all work together uh, inside the space. Um, I must say, this is the photo just after the opening, so it still looks very nice and organized. I can tell you, uh, it doesn't look like this anymore. It's a bit more chaotic, like it uh, is supposed to be in my in our sector office. Then we have our family room, and our family room is say the wooden part of the building. That is the part uh, where. We meet, where we socialize, where we lunch. Um, every day we have uh, between 12 and two, we eat lunch together with the whole office. 
Um, but it is also the place where the reception is, where, where, where visitors are coming in and they're uh, greeted. And it's also had uh, you see the stair here. This is a tri tribune that we use on a monthly, so not, uh, not weekly basis for lecture, for presentations. So this is really the, the heart of our building. And then on the right side, you see the colored uh, rooms. These are the meeting rooms. This is the, where, where we uh, invite our clients. And um, yeah, you know that we, uh, when you look at our projects, you know that we will, uh, we like color, we use color in our buildings, but we also use it in our own, own office. Um, at the moment you see, I'm in the light blue room. That's the model room. That's uh, the one that you see here on the lower right, but we have uh, all different types of rooms for different occasions. So here you see the orange room. It's a big meeting room where uh, big gatherings can play, take place. We can use all the walls because they are mag magnetic. Uh, to pin up things. We use the uh, glass walls to draw, uh, as you see in the other photo. So these are uh, meeting rooms, but also workshop rooms. Uh, but we also have other types of room. Eh? You see here the green room with all the flowers, where that's, that's a, a room where you can go back to write text, to do um, to work in, in, in seclusion on, on something. Uh, there are formal, in, more informal meeting rooms where you have maybe one-on-one -on -one or where, where you have a different kind of talk. And this also expresses actually to the outside. because so this is the front of our building where, uh, where you enter the building. So in the evening, you also actually see all these colors inside the building. They radiate out. Um, cultural, for me, is also, of course, more than just cultural buildings. So one of the things, and I saw already that you also thinking better because I saw already, for example, the glass farm behind it. So one of the things that also, of course, is culture is, our, is yeah, art and artists and the collaboration with artists. And we as MPO, we actually really like to work together with artists um, to sometimes add something as a layer, but also to sometimes really to co cooperate and to make a building that is together with the artists, uh, we create the whole building. Uh, one of the, I, I have a couple of examples. Uh, uh, what I said, a couple of them I will do in a very short, like three uh, slides. Some of them I uh, will have a more extensive uh, explanation. Um, and after this lecture, if you have any questions, we can always go into them. Uh, this is uh, in Warsaw. This, uh, you see here the front part, that was the existing building. And we were asked to actually extend it, uh, not only on the back for ha having extra square meters, but also on the on the rooftop to create a rooftop bar, create a restaurant on the top. Um, that, that, that was say uh, that was it. But we, what we did here, we worked together with a landscaper and an artist to create this space on the knee the building and on top of the building that somehow flows into each other. So we asked an artist actually to make one big mural that connects the whole ground floor to the top. Um, and it's a uh, hand painted mural that all, goes all the way, but so it starts at the bottom as a mural and then at the top it actually becomes this green oasis that is the restaurant that is, that is there on the top. Um, one of the other projects is the glass farm. Um, the, here, we, in, the, in, the, in the heart of the city, we were asked to create an, um, uh, a new building and then this is actually on the ground floor, it's uh, commercial. On the second floor, it's offices. And on the third floor, there is at this moment, there is a, a gym. Um, and we were asked for this program to make one uh, new building. Um, the envelope that we got for this building was actually in the shape of one of the, of, of the farms that you have a lot of this in this area around this, um, uh, around this uh, small town. And we thought, okay, it would be nice actually, because all these farms are disappearing and they're being broken down or being transformed. If we could make this one of these farms, but then in glass in the center of the heart of the building. And actually we blew it up 1.8 times. So it's 1.8 times bigger than a normal farm. And what we did is we went to all the farms in the neighborhood, photographed them all, measured them all, and in the end, um, Photoshop all together with Frank van der Zalm, the artist who we do work together with, and made it all into, uh, into one new image. Uh, and that's why also, you, for example, you see uh, what you see here, the window is, a, is from one farm. The inside of the window is actually from another farm. 
this window is from Mo'ala, another farm. It's all complicated. It's, it's one big Photoshop that we made. And then we printed this on glass. So everything that you see here is glass. Uh, on the outside, there's, no, there's only glass except for the um, door handles to get into the, uh, the building. For the rest, uh, we managed to make everything out of glass that is printed with a ceramic uh, inks and then baked into glass. And it gives this fantastic feeling that you're, when you're inside the building, you actually have this transparent bricks, transparent straw or, uh, or uh, transparent roof that is, you're sitting inside the picture, but also outside the picture. And that gives this fantastic quality that um, uh, uh, we, yeah, we were very happy to, to achieve. Um, and what I said, it's, so it's, it looks like an, uh, an, a, a real farm, but actually nothing is real because everything is made inside Photoshop from real elements of uh, farms. And because everything is 1.8 times as big, we also made the water well 1.8 times, uh, times as big, but also, for example, the benches are 1.8 times as big. So if you're sitting there, it's just too big for you as well, huh? because it's uh, it's not like a normal bench. But so we really extended that to everything around the, the whole building that was in our scope. Everything was 1.8, 1.6 times as, as big as normal. And of course, the effect of it especially at night, because you have this glass building, is that it becomes transparent and in the evening it actually transforms because it becomes this lantern in the middle of the, of the, of the town. Another small uh, project that we did, or that is actually being built at the moment, is a, a tower where we were asked to do the facade. This tower was, an, um, yeah, another architect made a design uh, in the middle of a, of a master plan that we did. You see here, it's the, the tower here in the middle. And the municipality actually said, yeah, sorry, but we are not going to build this design as uh, you design it. It, should, it needs an extra layer. What can, we, what can you do? And they actually came to us can you, and, uh, and, uh, and they asked, can you redesign the facade or can you make this facade more contemporary that it works with this whole because this is uh, this whole landscape that you see is all different gardens with different flowers and it's the new expo of uh, flowers that is going to open in the next two years um, can you do something with it and um, make uh, and, and, and help them to make this uh, the building more interesting so we said okay we have this arboretum for, with all these uh, species this 200 and uh, what was 207 species how, what can we do with them? Because all the plants are alphabetically, and there are uh, there uh, there are trees, there are smaller plants, there are, everything is uh, what we have here in Holland will be there. Um, how can we translate this into something that talks to the building? So we actually um, had a talk with a, uh, an artist, and what we said is, what if we project all these flowers, all these trees in different scales onto this building from the or from the origin. That they are in the in the plot to the building. Uh, so you, uh, we did that first with scripting, and we uh, we did it as the, in 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 the office, and that led to something like this, uh, where you see already here that the, the, the flowers that are closer, of course, are more uh, are more readable. Uh, but when it becomes further away, it becomes more of a mess. And we said, okay, uh, this is based, and together with the artist, we said, okay, we need to make a mural of the 1,800 species on this canvas that becomes the facade. After working together with them, this, this became this, uh, this, 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 the artist uh, made this uh, image um, that we use as a, as a, as a background of the, as the facade panels. And that is something, and that then is then also printed on the glass. And that is something that we at the moment building, and uh, that is uh, they're now at like uh, the, the tent level. Uh, and that is something that um, in in a couple of months the facade will be done, and uh, is a project that is, uh, will be there. Then. Uh, this is may uh, the mark hall. You probably uh, know it, but this is actually I'm not going to go into the building uh, too much, but. This is actually the biggest collaboration with an artist that we did because it's the biggest canvas that we ever made. 
Um, it's in the heart of Rotterdam, the Markt Hall, uh, where in the, because we removed the, the train was being removed, uh, the space was opened and there was the whole new area to, that was created. Um, a competition was organized um, where if you go to uh, you look at option three, we said, OK, we're not going to do the traditional option of a marked hall next to the apartments, but can we not combine it and make a better gesture, a bigger uh, impact on the city? Um, and that's say the, the third option that we uh, uh, proposed to the client. And he said, yeah, no, yeah, let's try it. And luckily we won the competition. Um, what you see here, that is there are three layers of parking underneath. There's a connection to the, the, the market floor. Uh, there's two layers of, uh, of uh, retail, and then the, the residential is really around this market hall that's in the middle. But we wanted to create something special in the inside of this uh, building, because it's a market hall. What do you do there? So when you come from the parking up into this building, what are you going to see? Uh, of course, so you come up and you see this uh, this roof. Of course, you see a lot of the, uh, uh, the you're in the market, you see a lot of different uh, products that you can get. Uh, there are places where you can eat. Uh, there, uh, you can sit on the top of them, but we wanted to do something with the campus that we had there. So we worked together with Arno Kuhne. He's the one who won the competition and he um, created the uh, cornucopia. Uh, the idea is that from the center of the, the roof, you, you see, say, the, the origin of all the um, uh, uh, fruit, vegetables coming out. And then you see, uh, and that, that means that, and in the back, you see the old Rotterdam, uh, but also the new Rotterdam. So you see the old church, but you also see, an, um, uh, for example, here, a construction crane. So it's uh, cornucopia, all the, the, the horn of um, decadence, but also the old Rotterdam and the future of Rotterdam. And this we turned into, yeah, I say a an, an, an contemporary 16 uh, chapel. Uh, we printed it on 4,000 aluminum panels and that became the inside of the, um, the building. So here you see really that the, the, the collaboration with the, um, uh, the, the artist bring something extra to this building. It, they, they, it's really part of the, um, of the environment and of the experience of the market hall. Here, here you see the total uh, canvas from one side. And there's also something that you actually exp uh, experience when you're inside your apartment. Here you see that uh, at night where you see that actually because of the light, this, it, it becomes really one of the most important uh, features of the building. Uh, now we get actually to a, bit, uh, a, a small project where we work together with two artists, Denial and Shivu Fly. Um, we were actually asked by a, a client uh, from Detroit into uh, the, you see here um, in the in the center is uh, you have Detroit Center that's really a compact small center, and then you have Eastern Market, and Eastern Market is the original and is still the the day market of uh, Detroit. Um, he had a, a small plot there, um, and when we first visited the site, we saw that there were murals at every facade in this uh, neighborhood. And we discovered that there was this uh, festival, murals at the market, um, that every year artists from all over the world came to the Detroit, came to this place and painted murals on uh, these buildings. And here on the top left, you see the, the, uh, the, that's the, 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 the mural that was actually at the building that we were going to demolish. And we said, okay, let's, what can we do with this, um, this, this inspiration? And what, can we use this to shape our building or to shape our facade? Um, so we, uh, so uh, we, we looked at it. It's a really creative co community uh, inside Detroit. It's one of the nicest neighborhoods it's because it's in, uh, Detroit is, of course, Motown. Everybody drives a car there. But this is actually the only place where everybody walks outside and actually also experiences outside. So we uh, demolished the building. This is the program that we have to make. We actually uh, 
create entrances and lobbies for the um, for the top two floors that is offices because the ground floor or the three top three floors has offices the ground floor is going to be retail we shift the the, the second block and we add a, a, a third block uh, for the access to the roof but also for um, MEP and other uh, elements so the uh, we thought and then we thought okay these three blocks can actually work as a canvas for the artists that we want to work with. So if you then look at the artwork for block one, uh, this was the existing uh, artwork that was there when we arrived there. It's, uh, it's, an art, it's from the artist Denial. And we said, okay, this is say the, what, what is there. How can we use this history? And you see also in the, in the two left images that the building was painted yellow at a certain moment, but it used to be a red building. So we said, can we not say, go make a Photoshop of the original facade, then paint it uh, again, uh, orange, uh, yellow and blue, take photos of the blue, uh, um, of the yellow facade, and then also work together with the Nile to make the, the, the next layer. So really have these historic layers of almost 100 years inside this new artwork, the, the artwork that we are going to create. So if you look at the south facade, actually you see that the south facade starts as the original facade, printed on glass, then turns into uh, the 1990s and then to the 2000s. And on top of that, we add the artwork of the contemporary artwork of the Nile that was already there. And that we now as like almost stickers together with him put back on it. And this led then to this totally new artwork where if you see here, you have the, the block, we added uh, the stickers, and that then gives the, the, the total uh, experience of this uh, building. Of course, we have to uh, uh, make sure that everybody inside the building has enough daylight and there's enough work. So we, we actually erase small dots so that uh, you can look outside and also can look inside on the ground floor because it's commercial. So you need big openings so that there, uh, you actually also see what kind of shop is there. And together with the uh, denial and the client, we created this first block. Then for the uh, second one, we actually uh, worked together with C.D. McFly. And he just gave us a total canvas. And we just draped this canvas on top of it. So over the whole block and then erased, say, the part where we needed to make windows. So all these clouds are erased from it. From it and this became the, um, the, the second block. And then we have the third block. And the third block, we thought, you know what? We're not going to do anything. This becomes part of this mural at the market. So in two years, it maybe look like this. And in five years or in four years, somebody else comes and there's a new painting on, on top of it. But that will, so the third block will be the constantly changing uh, block um, of the tree. And also here you see huh, the, the, the effect that it has between day and night, uh, the effect that you erase uh, holes to make daylight, uh, the clouds on, on top. Uh, yeah, it really gives an, a fantastic expression to the building and it really does working with this artist really gives an, gives an extra layer to this otherwise quite simple building. Now we go a bit more into the cultural institutions. For example, um, the Stedelijk Museum in Schiedam. I will, that was, we were asked for this, uh, with this museum to actually solve uh, a couple of problems. They, it's, it's an, a historic building. So they wanted to, to have a new entrance. They wanted to have a place to store stuff. They wanted to have a, a desk for the, maybe for, the, for the person sitting there and welcoming people. Uh, they wanted to have a shop. And, but the biggest problem was there was actually not enough floor space and we were not allowed to touch the building or to change it because it was a monument. So we, in the end, we actually turned it around and we didn't build something in the middle, but we actually built something around it. And we actually, it's, it's, it's an, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cupboard, but it's a cupboard that is actually standing loose from everything. So you see here, here that it, 
it goes around the windows, it goes around everything that's inside the building. And it's also something that is really not attached to the building. So we can take it out, out of the building in, in 10 or 20 years and uh, there won't be any hole because it's all uh, standing on its own. It's really one uh, piece of furniture that is just uh, as an insert in this building. And yeah, you, yeah, so and thereby actually creating enough open space so that they can have the restaurant, they can have the, but the they have also enough space to store all the all, all the projects. They can show still some art on the top floors. So it, it really functions as this this this, this all these uh, different questions that they have they, that they had. The China Comic and Animation uh, Museum. Um, I'm going to uh, skip through this very quickly. Um, it's it, this is a very funny uh, project. Um, we wanted, but sadly we didn't build it. Um, there, here, the idea behind was uh, it's it's a, it's a comic and an animation. So we thought the whole idea behind it was: can we use elements from uh, comics uh, and um, uh, the, the really the iconic idea? So the, the you see the the the, the speed uh, balloons that that you always see in, in comics. And we thought, can we make a building out out out, out, out of this uh, uh, balloons? Um, we worked on that, and that in the end turned into this uh, in, into this building. Um, uh, with then where inside there was this routing there where you could then have this Chinese cultural. Uh, 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 strips, comics, uh, but also uh, you also see Tom and Jerry here. So, so it re was really this whole museum environment that was connected with an, uh, a, a loop through the, all of these uh, balloons. Uh, we won the competition, but sadly it was never built. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, that's also part of uh, of life as an architect. And this is and this is I think an uh, interesting uh, project, the imprint in Seoul. Um, because a problem with cultural buildings, yeah, for example, in here, there uh, uh, the, the program changed a little bit, but there was there's a theater inside of one of the buildings, and there was um, a cinema in one of the other uh, buildings. But the big problem with these two buildings, or they actually there's, there's a nightclub now, is of course a nightclub, a theater. They really don't need, uh, or cinema, they really don't need any um, daylight. It's mostly a, 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 a closed box that, uh, in, and this is next to the, uh, to the airport. So what do you do then? What we thought is, okay, so they don't want to have any windows, but we do want to do something special. So we actually copied the facade of the buildings that are next to us and imprinted that on the concrete. And then actually the two facades that are opposite in between our building, they, they became blank. And there we uh, all the lines come together and they flow into this opening where we actually lifted the concrete and where then is this tunnel that goes underneath the building and comes out of the, in the other end. And um, that is actually the entrance to the building. So you have this tunnel that is actually all LED and it can change uh, uh, it is in uh, Korea, so they, 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 they love this, uh, these LED screens and they love changing uh, colors. So by mirroring this and having this, all these LEDs on the, on the ground, it becomes this fantastic entrance to this nightclub, to this cinema. And on the outside, it, it becomes this fantastic object that is almost an artwork, uh, but also... Um, Say uh, is contemporary because it's really. Uh, let's go back to this image. Uh, it copies the, the the buildings around it. Um, this is a building that has been delivered just a couple of months ago. It's a depot in Rotterdam. It's um, a depot or an art storage, literally next to the museum um, in the park. Uh, and inside, but the, the, the fantastic thing about this, it's a public depot. Normally, uh, every uh, big museum has a big depot where they store all their extra uh, paintings, uh, paper, uh, artworks. 
but that's something that's always dark, it's closed, and you're not allowed to visit. And the, the director of the museum that owns this depot said, I want to actually turn it around because we have 150,000 items that we can never show. Let's make this depot public. Let's open it to the, uh, to the people. Uh, so what we did is actually on the, uh, you see that on the, on the top there are these trees. That's actually a public garden with a restaurant. So uh, during the day you can go up, go to the restaurant, have a drink and have this beautiful view over Rotterdam. And in between you have this void that is actually um, all these uh, big steel beams are going to be uh, cladded with glass and they're going to use it as exhibition spaces. So while you go up, you actually pass these glass cubes that have elements in them um, that are from, uh, from that depot. And the nice thing uh, of this um, glass boxes is that you perceive these elements in a different way. Okay? Normally, if you go to a museum, you see a painting and you only see the front of the painting. But now by placing this painting inside the glass box, I can see the bottom of the painting, but maybe more, even, even more important, I can see the back of the painting. And actually you can learn a lot by, from also the back of the painting, because you see where it's been, how old it's been, how is it made on canvas or a wooden panel. So it's really interesting to see these objects are in different ways than you would normally uh, see them in the museum itself. And then around it, you have these big, these are the, say, the blue holes are the uh, uh, storages. And these are actually going to be open um, during certain days uh, where you then can go and have a look and, uh, at elements. And, uh, and also the rest of the building is then being also used. Uh, there are more floors of storages, but there are, are also actually rooms where people uh, work on the restoring art or preserving, uh, packing. One of the big things that museums do, of course, is sending their, their collection to other museums for bigger exhibitions. Uh, they need to pack this or they need to receive this and, um, and treat it. And that's all going to be done in this building, but it's all going to be public and you can see, actually see it, how this works. And so that, uh, so the, you see here the, the, the racks, and at, at this moment, and it, they're in the last phase, they're, they, they're, how, they're moving this 150,000 pieces that they have into this the depot building. And in a couple of months, the whole uh, building will open to, to the public. Now I go into uh, an, a, a bit more, uh, uh, say, public buildings in the sense of uh, the program. This is a building where you have a, a, a theater, offices, uh, but most important, uh, they wanted to have a house for the com community. So we uh, put all the programs in the optimal shape, uh, put them inside the bounding box, cut off what we couldn't uh, fit in the box, and then you get this in-between space. And this in-between space, we of course need to know, knew that we needed to use it for connections. Um, but as I said, one of the big, uh, so uh, yeah, these are the zones, I will go for So these connections, of course, hey, you need to enter the building, you need to go from the thing zone to the culture zone or to the work zone. Um, yeah, and then you can do, of course, these are the normal ways that you do this, that is with uh, corridors, uh, bridges, but it is also going to be a, a, a daycare and it, there are a lot of children that are going to use this because it's really this center inside the community. And we thought we wanted to make a building that you can explore, that this can be actually more, be more exciting. So how can we use it in between zone to make it a more exciting building? So we actually turned this in between zone, not only into your community space where you can have a drink, where you can sit, and where there are uh, uh, spots where you can play, but it's also like almost a gym and an, uh, a fun zone where you can train. So uh, this is one of the ways where you can actually go from one floor to the other. Instead of uh, taking the stairs, you have to really climb uh, via, via this wooden structure, or if you come down, you can actually take the mesh uh, tunnel to come down. There are places where you can run, where it's allowed for children to run in this building, where it's actually encouraged. 
You have places where you can climb from one floor to the other. And also, of course, yeah, there are just places where you can uh, relax, where you can sit, where you can, uh, you see in the, the, the yellow box in the back where there are just the computers, where you can have courses, where you can learn. So it's all of this in this building, but we try to make it more exciting than just these stack of boxes. And it becomes this uh, this building, and of course, it also has to do with the climate. Eh? This is this is in Denmark. It's a different climate than in uh, Mexico. Uh, it rains here a lot, so people are inside a lot. So it is really this house of culture, this house of the people, where people can uh, uh, hang around and uh, do stuff. Another Danish project is the Rockmagnet and the uh, Roskilde School. Um, I don't know if you have heard of Roskilde, but Roskilde is one of the biggest um, festivals in uh, in Europe. It's um, it, uh, pre-COVID, it used to be once a year uh, in, in the beginning of the summer, and it's a festival where 70,000 people come to listen to music. They wanted to expand uh, their uh, reach so that it's not only a, a, a five-day festival once a year, but they actually wanted to have a new office building, but also a museum and a school. So they, they approached us uh, together with uh, a local uh, Dennis firm, uh, Kobe, to work together on this project. And we, what we did is uh, we thought, okay, how can we change, the, or what, how can we script this so that it becomes something that is related to the, uh, to the music, uh, but it's also an uh, exciting uh, idea. So we said, yeah, as a rocker, you of course, ex uh, as an artist, you arrive at the red bar carpet, you have to sign the autograph from the people that are standing there, then you take your career, gets a boost, so you, you, you go up to the next level. You have the, uh, the, 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 the exhibition in the museum. You have the, 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 the exhibition, and on, on the way down, of course, uh, after your life of uh, fame, you go to the bar and drink uh, and, and, and drink because uh, uh, that's uh, what you do. So we turn this whole story narrative into um, the rock magnet, the, the, the building. Uh, this became, became the narrative of, of this whole, uh, the whole building. Uh, so yeah, here you have the rock magnet and that's the, the dark yellow. The red is the communal house that's not yet built. And then you have the, the light yellow, that's the Roskilde Festival of, uh, and the school. Um, and uh, and that's, that's already, so the two yellow blocks are built at the moment and the other two are still on their way. And that's uh, when they have money again, we will continue with these, the, these two projects. So part of the project is renovation where we insert uh, projects into this renovated whole buildings. And the part of the project is uh, our new additions to it. So this was a concept sketch that we made for the competition. And actually this is the, the building that we uh, delivered. So if you go back, uh, this is the concept. And this is how it looks now. It's uh, pretty close. Uh, it uh, worked out quite well. Um, so this is the facade. It's this steel studded uh, facade. Uh, this is the entrance. And then you go up to the, and then the top one is the exhibition hall. And now it's still, and then uh, next to it, we have the School of Rock, the Roskilde School of Music um, that we also uh, completed. Uh, so that was an existing structure where we didn't want to change the structure. So we maintained it, made and only uh, made, made sure that the facade and, and the whole roof was as good as possible again. And then in, we inserted it boxes. Um, and in these boxes are then there is the program, or actually also here in between the boxes is a large part of the program. So this is the entrance uh, of the school. Now here you see the boxes with uh, the classrooms inside, but you also see that in between the boxes actually there is already a lot of happening. There you see that people meet, children come together. Um, and this is one of the boxes that where you're inside where this is uh, one of the classrooms. But also here you see that this in-between space can be used as a space where you can have exhibitions, but it's also a space where you can do a performance if there is a big performance inside the school. 
So it's really also here we try to combine the boxes that have the fixed program and in between make this flexible program that you can use in different ways. Now, here you see one of the uh, where a lecture that's get, being given inside the school. Um, now we go to something more serious, books, libraries. Um, I'm going to show two libraries. Uh, one is the Book Mountain in Spikenisse. Uh, this is a, a, a building in Spikenisse. It's a small town, uh, like 20 kilometers from Rotterdam, where I, I'm currently at. And they ask us to make a new library. But when they ask us, we already saw that the idea of a library is changing. I mean, 20 years ago, a, a library, when you build a library, it was a closed box because you needed to treat the, the, the books. And there was a place where you would go get some books and then leave again. But we now see that the library is actually much more. People go there to sit, to have a drink, to read, to read the newspaper, but also to use the computers that are there. Um, so it's a really different um, building from 20 years ago. So we thought, can we turn this around and actually celebrate the, 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 the library? So what we did is actually, we made a route uh, to the tower of this, uh, the top of this building. And all, along this route are all the books from uh, children's books to uh, teenagers and then on alphabetically going up um, uh, to the top. So you have, you can walk up, you see uh, it's all, everything is covered in books. And then uh, you go to the top and there you have this cafe where you can sit and can read. But on a, And then inside this mountain that you see are the computers, our meeting rooms, there's a lecture room, uh, the people that work in the library, they're inside this covered uh, mountain of books. Uh, the Tanjin uh, Library, and this is um, uh, this this was an interesting uh, problem that we got. We were asked to uh, uh, to design a library uh, in Tan Tanjin, and um, during the process, we actually found out when we were there, uh, it's it's a it's 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 a library, but there was also a small cinema inside, and that's actually inside this round ball that you see. Um, but we discovered that actually they only had like 50,000 books and that's, uh, that's in uh, say a small part of the building. Um, but yeah, they, we, we really wanted to make, uh, this, uh, our end, but we, they really wanted to have this huge building. So what we did is actually we made this huge open space in the middle, also this communal space that acts as um, a square inside the building. So we pushed in, say, this ball, this, this cinema or the, the, this uh, presentation room, push it in and that echoes into to the, uh, to the outside of the, the building. So this is this, say, public square that is inside this building where people can meet, where people can sit, um, where they can get some books and read. And then and you also see now how this is after the opening that it is really this space where people come together gather uh, shelter for the sun and it, it really adds this quality to this uh, city that wasn't there uh, yeah and i thought yeah i don't i thought it's, it's also interesting not to just talk only about buildings but also about other cultural program, uh, programs, or maybe maybe not even, yeah, uh, how culture sometimes changes. Uh, and I, I'm going to start with uh, the stair in uh, Rotterdam. It's actually a project that, uh, uh, this is Rotterdam, uh, pre-Second World War. During the World War, Rotterdam was uh, uh, almost flattened. Um, uh, and. And 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 after the head, this is how it looked after the uh, after the the bombards um, or the, the Second World War, and after the Second World, it needed to be rebuilt, um, and we called it the Vede Opbouw, uh, and a lot of beautiful buildings are have been built, and that uh, and like a, a couple of years ago, you could say we were finally finished after 60 years, 
And then they said it would be nice because yeah, uh, then the, uh, the, the Rem Kohlhaas building was finished, the new uh, central station was finished. So you could say Rotterdam uh, at that moment was finished, but uh, we're never finished. It's a city, so you're always changing. But they said, we need to do something to celebrate this moment. Uh, and they came to us and they said, how can we um, do something in the city that is public for everybody, that shows this wederopbouw, um, uh, that does something with, and then here on the left, you see the Groot Handelsgebouw, that is one of the monuments of, the, uh, of, of this resurrection of the city. I said, how, what can we do? How can we do something to uh, show uh, to the, to, to the people uh, how Rotterdam actually looks at this moment. So we said, ah, uh, maybe we can, uh, so this is a sketch that at the, was made at that moment, we can get people to the roof of this building so they actually can see the builders, the city, and they can see that it is finished now. So we, um, uh, we suggested this and uh, it was uh, built. This is actually our shortest building that we ever made because it was only there for six weeks and then it was demolished again. But uh, we made it, yeah, what I said, this was a sketch and two months later it was there and two months later again it was gone. But this became an instant hit in uh, Rotterdam. Everybody wanted to go up uh, to the top of the building to have this look. So you see, this is actually uh, after two weeks, there were still lines of people standing there. Uh, because you had this unique view on top of the city uh, that actually uh, on from a roof they were, that is normally not accessible. And yeah, uh, you see, it was used in all different kinds of ways. It was, it was really funny. Uh, they did fashion shows on it. Uh, there, 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 there was a farmer actually that came in the morning and he covered the whole stair with vegetables from top to bottom. And then in the, later in the, in the restaurant on the top of the building was used to turn into soup. So it was a really a fantastic uh, uh, small project or big project, a uh, small project with a big impact in, in the city. And this actually led um, to another project. Uh, and that is the Seolu, Seolu 7070. Um, also there, uh, Seoul is a city that in the late 60s, early 70s changed. They had this rapid growth. Um, and this is uh, Seoul in 1969. And they had, they, so they, they had this rapid growth and they needed more transport. And this is, you see here, the, the road uh, that goes from one side of the city over the railway tracks to the other side of the city. Uh, here you see it again. But in 19, uh, 2017, they discovered that actually the structural uh, structure of this road wasn't stable enough anymore to have all these cars on top of it. So they needed to close it down and they asked architects, can you come up with an idea to reuse this structure? Uh, so they closed it, uh, they, they, they had a competition. Uh, here, here you see it, it goes from one side uh, of the city to the other side and in the middle you have these train stations this a lot uh, uh, this six lane road uh, crossing the city and we said yeah what can we do with it uh, you have this nice little neighborhood that are disconnected at the moment uh, how can we connect these neighborhoods and these green elements that you actually see how we can we connect them together and we thought maybe we can actually somehow make an arboretum in the middle of the city can we use this bridge as a an arboretum where we will grow plants, and if they are big enough, then they we, we, we are going to replant them in the in the city, um, and uh, and also turn this into a, a connector, actually between these two uh, or these these neighborhoods, and actually intensify this. So this is what the, this is the original uh, uh, road that was there, and we said. What if we connect them to the train station, into the buildings, into the other neighborhoods that are there? So start adding connections and um, uh, so that it really becomes this element that is going to connect all these neighborhoods with, uh, with each other. Uh, so we went from uh, this to this. Uh, this uh, we won the competition. 
uh, and it was a very uh, short and intensive project, but a year later it was opened and it is now this fantastic walkway between this neighborhood that goes over all this, yeah, you, here you see it, the trains, the, uh, the cars, it connects all these neighborhoods. And we added uh, the plants, the arboretum that's on the top uh, as a green element in, the, in this hard urban uh, environment. Um, we added uh, small uh, pavilions where you can get a drink or can sit. Uh, we added extra uh, connections to the neighborhoods. And sometimes it's a, tire, a stair, sometimes it's an escalator. We added here uh, islands in the middle of this road where you can, uh, where, the, where this element lands and where, it, where you can, uh, can sit, get, get a drink and get, then get off of this uh, uh, track. We added connections. Uh, you see here one, two buildings that are to the surrounding buildings so that they actually have new entrances on, on this level so that it also becomes actually this new platform that they that connects the buildings. And it's, it, it's really this new element that connects all these neighborhoods and that's, uh, yeah, it's just a fantastic uh, thing to see. And it, it, this is how it looks at night. All the plants have LED lights underneath and we can control the light. And here they all blow. Oh, yeah. We cannot, but the city can control the lights. And then it turns into this nice environment that uh, is not only uh, safe to walk, but also a nice connector between all these, uh, safe connector between all these little parts of the city. And the, one of the big things of this project, of course, was that it turned old building in into something new uh, or an old uh, uh, street into a, something new that not only connected people connected um, uh, connected neighborhoods but also brought back another type of nature inside the building so, uh, of the city so you have more green there you have uh, it changes actually the environment. If you're on the bridge uh, and it's a hot day because of all these plants, you have shadow, you get this microclimate. And this is something that led to another project and that's Tainan Spring in Tainan, where in the city of Tainan, where you actually again see this really gray city that in the, few, in the past had a lot of connection with the water. Um, but also here in the 70s, it, it expanded immensely and it was really a gray, uh, city. Uh, our location, uh, this was the, the location, it was the Chinese warehouse uh, that uh, of the, yeah, the Chinese warehouse that was in the, um, on, on the location. Um, when we were involved, it looked like this, they partly demolished it already. Um, and this was the, the, the site and they said, okay, we saw what you did and say, you, what, what could, what could we do here? So instead of demolishing everything, he said, yeah, what, what if we turn this into an oasis in the middle of the city? So we turn this actually into this water park. Uh, so we refer to the, the existing structures that there were there, and we turn this into an oasis into the city. So here you see the old uh, structure, and then downstairs we made this water uh, park that actually creates this microclimate inside this uh, city. That is a, 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 an area where kids can play. And then actually on the side where you have little shops where you can buy something to drink, where you can sit in the shade. Uh, and by uh, vaporizing water, it actually really uh, changes the climate there in, in here. And it's really this nice element where people sit. And you see here, actually, it's not only children, but actually also a lot of all the people use it and go there because they, they find it interesting and they find it a nice place to sit and to relax. And this is how it looks at the, at night. And I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, because I've been on, going on for more than a year and I also want to have a talk with you and see if you have any questions. I think I'm going to stop at this moment. <clears throat> France, 
thank you for uh, the great lecture. It's really amazing for our students, especially the students that are involved with this studio, because here we have other, other studios that are also joining us for your lecture today, to get to see all these projects directly from a partner at MBRDB. So it's a really a luxury for us. And again, we'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to open, as you mentioned, to the Q&A process. And uh, just to kick off questions, I, I have one first uh, starter question. And then our students from the studio will have their questions. And then if we have still more time for the remaining uh, students that are joining us can also uh, throw in their questions in, their, in our chat. I think from what we've seen today with the MVRDV projects, we can definitely say that there is an incredible sense of optimism in all the projects. And I've heard uh, Vinny talk about happy places. And I think you, you mentioned that a little bit in your introduction. Now, as an architect, as a practicing architect, and as I perceive from the work that you presented, a lot of it's competition based. And in a couple of projects that you mentioned, you said, well, here's our design, but unfortunately it didn't get built. Uh, that's kind of our standard for us in our, in our line of jobs as architects. And you mentioned that's how architecture works, right? But I'm wondering if you can provide us a little bit of, um, uh, let's say, words of encouragement or, 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 or how, how do you guys also deal with this if so much of your work is through competition? Because it's already difficult for us to get a project designed and then built. A lot of them don't get built. But a lot of the competitions just don't go on after the competition for many reasons. Many times, it's most of the time, it's a client issue. Sometimes competitions Political. Get, yes. Sometimes competitions get two rounds, right? So yes. maintaining the optimism in our lives so that we can design optimistic and happy places, as you've shown, in the environment of design not built, design competition not won. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I think one, one, one thing that helps is that uh, most people here in MVRDV are actually quite optimistic, are very optimistic. Um, and we all love, really love what we're doing and believe in our buildings. Um, so sometimes you lose and or uh, you lose a competition, but you know that you did the best building possible from our standpoint. And that's, that's, I think that's really important. We always try, and so of course we um, mitigate on uh, what we send in and think about the location and think about the, the, the jury. Uh, a German building will always be different from a building that I will do in America because their, their, their culture is just a big difference and they will, will not accept the same things or you need to explain it in a separate, a different way. Um, but most of the, it's important that you have always something that you feel very comfortable about. That is the best that for this location. Um, and sometimes, yeah, of course it is shit. If they, uh, I, the, the, the comic museum that I showed you, we won it, it's a fantastic, we found it a fantastic idea, idea. everybody loved it, and then after a year, uh, the government came and said, sorry, we don't have funding anymore. We're stopping the project. That's devastating. Um, but yeah, there, uh, some, that's, that's because you, you are so close and it's a fantastic uh, idea and fantastic building. If you then don't build it. Uh, but that afterwards is also, yeah, there's always a new project. There's always something new that, that keeps you go, going again. And that helps. And luckily, um, we build enough or we do enough to make a difference and to, to keep it really interesting. And also, if you never win something or you never build something, uh, yeah, then it becomes really difficult. Uh, but luckily enough, there's, a, there's enough that we can do. And also, we see also more because we have some recognition now, of course, that there are still more and more clients that come to us directly because they want to have a building from MBRDV. And they want to work with us together. And actually, they don't want to have a building from MVRDV. They want to work with us together to see what kind of building they are uh, going to get. Because uh, people come to us with a question normally. They don't say, I want to have an MVRDV building. They say, I want to, I need an office. And this and this and this is my problem. How can we solve this? Right. And that is what we see more and more, that people come to us with uh, difficult problems and how to solve it. 
and, and also, that also is that, that that becomes more and more also and that's maybe i think the more the most encouraging thing also for your students that becomes more and more also the role of the architect mm -hmm. helping your client solving their problems solving problems for my students how many times have we said that before but i take away we have happy people working there you need to really believe in what you're doing and i would add france that sometimes or often the building not being built or the competition not winning is not a loss because then you can take those ideas and kind of retransform them for another project as you say there's always something new right i like to open the microphone to yeah. our students uh anna sofia you want to start off with your first question yes first of all thank you for your time and uh, my question is has mbrtv had any project opportunities in mexico Um, sorry, I, I, I have a problem with my son. Am, am I breaking up or is it, or, or uh, was, were, uh, is it only uh, Anna Sophia at the moment? No, breaking yes, up? a little bit. We have a little bit of lag, but did you hear Anna Sophia's question, Franz? You, you know what? Shall I, shall I, uh, switch to the other, uh, we can do the that. camera. Maybe that's, that's, that I will do that. That has a better connection. So sure. Two seconds, Anna, and then I come back to you. Okay, we can see you uh, now, France. There's a little bit of a doubling. There we go. Now it should be good. That's perfect, yes. So, Anna, if you can repeat your question, please. Yes, that my question was that has MBRDV had any project opportunities in Mexico? Um, yes, actually, um, uh, I did. Uh, we actually built already something in uh, Mexico, but it's a secret project. It's a private villa uh, that has been built in Mexico. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, I did a lecture in Villa Mosa, um, and that actually led to a, a, a meeting and. Uh, I'm hoping to do a project uh, starting this uh, uh, this after this year in um, uh, Saltillo, which is only 30 minutes away from here, France. And actually, a lot of our students are from Saltillo because they come here to Monterrey to come to this uh, architecture program of, of UDEM, which that's nice to hear. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, we're in the final stages, and uh, I hope that that, uh, that that is something that will start in the coming uh, two months. Franz, I'm going to put you on the spot because you might need some people from Saltillo for internships, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> no uh, need we to have answer. To, no, no, that, it is actually interesting because I, I, I'm always thinking um, when I have a lecture like this, do we have somebody from uh, Mexico at the moment at staff? But we have... 34 different nationalities at the moment in our office, but there's nobody from Mexico. We need to do something about that. Yes. Okay, I'd like to pass on then the microphone to Cindy. Cindy, adelante, por favor. Uh, hi, friends, and thank you for being with us today. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say how I enjoy seeing all the MVRDB projects and how I just feel like they're um, they're unique some of them are like simple but it still feels like there's no limit to architecture and well my question is that I as a student I feel like I have a lot of trouble um, like defining what materials are the best for my projects and stuff and do you know do you have any tips that you can give us to make better decisions on defining what materials go together or what we can use to make uh, to make our projects better. Um, yeah, material. It's always that you have to look where am I building, what am I building, and what is appropriate. And uh, sometimes, of course, you see if you look at our buildings when we do, uh, for example, the glass farm or uh, there there 
the material came from the problem that we saw and then we look at the, the we do the research and then and then this is something that we really developed together with the mm -hmm. the glass um glass manufactory and of course uh, the glass printing at that moment was not at that level we really brought it to that level um how do we come to the decision for the um, uh, materials it it is normally what we see is that it is it comes from an inspiration that you get when you're at at the the the, the neighborhood or it from an uh, it's actually it's depending um because we can use any material on any location. But for example, I'm doing a building in New York um, and that is in uh, Manhattan, but it's really at the top part of Manhattan. And that, that is a Latin uh, neighborhood. And it was the first time that we came there and we're doing a, it's a high rise. Uh, it's a 27 uh, stories, but it was, it was already the first time that we came there was clear. It's not going to be a glass tower. Sometimes uh, it, it, and because it's a it's a neighborhood that is uh, comprised out of small buildings, smaller uh, grain of uh, buildings. So we also broke our tower up in smaller pieces, and they all got a different color uh, brick, and that is um, really related to this neighborhood. We saw that uh, in this neighborhood, you don't want to do a glass tower like the rest of Manhattan. You want to do something that fits with this neighborhood. But then, uh, of course, we wanted to do uh, something special. That's why it became a. Uh, we used then instead of standard bricks, mm -hmm. we lose uh, ceramic bricks that have color. So we use yellow, uh, green, and blue ones. Um, so for us, sometimes it's also a struggle. So it's, a, it's also something uh, that is something that is. Uh, where we really need to search, what do you do, what do you want? But I see that a lot of the times it comes from the local uh, uh, knowledge and local presence and what you see there. And sometimes as well, uh, I think if you're mentioning France, you take inspiration from the site, you take inspiration for what's the best material for the problem to solve, the solution. Yeah. Sometimes you also subvert the order, like for example, in your uh, Amsterdam shop, uh, with the glass bricks, right? There, there was a problem yeah. with the municipality. You have the local material, which is the Dutch brick, you know, the Dutch school of treating brick. And then you kind of turn it on its head and make it into glass. Yeah, now there, there, uh, there one of the uh, things is, if you look at this street, this street is really destroyed. They destroyed all the ground floors, opened up and it, they just classified it. And we said, how can we, in this case, how can we, actually bring it back to a, a, a brick building. But of course we know it's a shop, so they want to have light. They want to have, uh, the, they want that people can uh, look in. But there we just turned it upside down and we said we made the whole facade out of glass bricks. Okay, uh, our next question comes from Lulu. And for the people that are out of our initial 16 people studio, uh, once our questions, of our students run out, you can ask your questions as well. So if you stay here for the duration of as long as France has time, because we need to consider France's time, you'll be able to uh, send in your questions. Uh, Lulu, adelante por favor. Yes, hi friends. Uh, I really appreciate the time you put in us here and I really enjoyed all the presentation and all the projects. I am really interested in your studio. It, it really, it's amazing to see all the projects. And I have a little bit of, of context to, to tell you for my next question. And is in this course, we are going to make our final project as an expansion to a museum. Is the museum I have here in my background. Uh, it's located here in Monterey. And I want to ask you, which will be your main concerns if you were to propose an expansion to an existing museum? I saw in your presentation that you already did, so I really wanted to ask you this to know what tips you have for us and, and that. Um, yeah, this museum, of course, the, the, it, it's, it, uh, it's a beautiful uh, museum, but it's, um, uh, I forgot his name, uh, the architect. Legorreta. Yeah, Legoretta, he really, um, well, yeah, it, it could always be an MPRDV building. It's really this one gesture, one color, one, 
And what do you add there? I think uh, personally, if I look at this, it, 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 of course, it's fantastic to add there, but there's also the question, what are you going to do? Are you going to confront it? So, uh, and that, that is, of course, the question that you, that all of you have to uh, ask yourself. Do you want to confront it? So is it something that, uh, or do you really respect this building? But how do you respect it? Also by something, putting something maybe on top of it or through it, you can make this, even the, the existing building stronger. But it also means that what you're doing needs to be, because it's a very strong building. It's a very uh, iconic building. It's so it, what you're doing need, also needs to have um, it needs to complement it, but it also shouldn't be the same. I think what you're saying there also, Franz, is that there's a conversation with the existing yes. and the new, and you need to curate as an architect, what is that conversation going to be, right? Yeah, no, yeah, and then and, and, the, and the interesting question that you have to ask yourself is, what is the conversation that my building is going to have with it? Right? Uh, the easy way maybe would be to do an extension that is in the same material or and in a slightly different color. But is it the most interesting question? Is it the most, most interesting conversation? I personally, I would say no, but that is something I would say that's something that in your studio, you need to go, go, find out for yourself. How are you going to confront this powerful building? So what you're going to do is needs to be a conversation that also need you need to create something that is equal or that, helps this building, makes it stronger. And I'm already really excited for December when we'll be able to come back to this conversation and then you can see what the students have done. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm also excited because this is a, it's a really interesting um, uh, question. And that's why I also try to say, say navigate around it because I know what I would do, but it, I'm really <laughs> curious to see what you would do. Yeah, we, we shouldn't give students. it away. Exactly. Uh, Lily, Lily Brown, you have a question. Yes. Okay. So, hello. My name is Lily. I'm actually from Saltillo. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, I wanted as well to thank you for your time. The presentation was incredible. All of the examples are amazing. Um, so now I'm going to ask you about in my case study that I have right here, the Serpentine Pavilion. Uh, so well, we know that when they were working on the pavilion, it didn't got built because it was really expensive. It was high cost. So I wanted to know if you know if there were any efforts that the, that, that the design team or NBRV made in order to reduce the cost to build it like it obviously didn't, but did they do any effort to the weight? Yeah, no. Um, the Serpentine Pavilion is actually a project that I worked on. Um, so I was closely involved. Um, I don't know if you know, but there is actually no budget for the Serpentine Pavilion. Every time, every year that they make the Serpentine Pavilion, they need to raise money um, uh, from the donate, from donations to get to create this. Um, so we're, when we were asked to do this uh, project, um, everybody was really excited, uh, but in the end found out that it was too complicated and too expensive to build. Um, but the funny thing was that, because we really tried to actually mitigate and see if we could do it uh, differently, but also the client of Serpentine said, yeah, no, but um, we don't want to change it. We want to do it or like this, or we don't do it, and then it becomes this never built the first time never built server time but they they also didn't accept say a, a, a half baked version of this they really wanted to have or this or not and, and in the end that's that, that, that so we try to uh get it but uh it stayed like a, how what you say behind you and uh, sadly it never is built and that's why it's now the only never built serpentine time pavilion and, and Franz, this is one of the early pavilions. It's one of the first few. Uh, what, what was the one? What, what were the predecessors before the MBRDB design? Um, oh, I, I have to. That's a long time ago. <laughs> but this is. Uh, was there a Saha one before that, or no? Saha no? was after. It was after. So it's really early. It's really one of the first pavilions. Yeah, I think this is somewhere in still in the nineties. Okay, correct. 
Okay, uh, our next question comes from Aideen. Hi, friends. Thank you for your lecture. I really enjoyed it. I'm currently working with two projects for my case studies. One of those is the theater on the Parade Lantern, which is the one I have right here behind me. Yep. And while researching it, uh, I noticed that there's a second version for this project, the theater on the Parade. And I was wondering if you could tell me about the difference between the two versions, since they both share location and program. What is the reason for the two versions? Yeah, no, this is actually the question goes back directly to the first question that uh, Viviano uh, asked me. Um, the, the first project was a competition uh, that they organized uh, and that uh, we actually uh, competed. But after this competition, they discovered that they made a mistake uh, and that's the organizers. And they, uh, so, and that's like one and a half years or a year later, and they had to cancel everything and redo the whole comp competition. Um, they also then they saw, found out that the funding was a problem, so they, they changed funding. So that's why there, it was a new competition where we also uh, participated again because we were asked to participate again. Um, sadly, that this time we didn't win, but uh, so yeah, it was a competition that was that was successful, but then because of uh, mistakes that uh, they made in organization and funding pro uh, problems, they had to redo it. Uh, and uh, that's why you have two projects on the same location. Product of yeah, and that's and, and, and that's it's a big problem because right? it's not only us, but it's like eight offices who spend time and uh, on this pro on this and uh, like uh, five of them had to do it twice. <laughs> and people, these things happen all the time. This is not a weird coincidence. This is how we work when we're working during competitions. Uh, Okay, next question comes from Anna Lu. Yeah, good evening, friends. Thank you for accepting our invitation to form part of this studio and your time for this lecture. And first of all, I would like to mention that I'm a big fan of MVRDB projects. Since last semester, Diana gave me the Mirador project as my case study. And this semester, as you can see, the IBIM is one of my case studies. And at the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned that you worked closely in the project. So I would like to ask, how fully developed was the project? Um, we have some renderings from your website or online publications. And do the different colors in the facade represent the different internal programs or have another meaning similar to the interior of the MVRDD office? Um, uh, no, the different, the, the, say the windows that you see were the different programs that were inside. And actually, the say the dark space that you see was actually an interior space that that was also programmed, but there was a continuous space uh, in between it. Um, the project wasn't that far developed, or it was quite far developed, but it was a competition, and never and it never came out of the competition. Say so, um, and also this is a really old project. Uh, so also. Uh, what we produced at that moment were, for example, uh, models. Uh, so there's a huge model actually of this uh, project. Uh, and we have uh, some, some, some cut drawings and that kind of things, but uh, the 3D models also were not that uh, uh, developed at that moment like they are now. Uh, the skills at that moment were not at, that, at the level that they are now. So you see different kinds of uh, Photoshop uh, collages more than uh, the, the real-time renderings that we use now in, uh, in, in these kind of uh, 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 projects and uh, uh, competitions. I think that's beautiful to see, you no, know, in an in a architecture portfolio, the, the passing of time and architectural representation. I, I was studying architecture when this competition came out, when it became public knowledge. And I remember there was an issue there with Lisa Architecture and, and Dillard's Cofidio. There was a bit of a... Uh, PR issue of the projects looking alike and this kind of thing. It was, yeah. it was super interesting uh, to get to be aware of these discussions while studying. That was brand new info for me. Okay, thank you, Analu. Uh, so, uh, Franz, we've, we're half an hour, we're 20 minutes into the Q&A. How are you doing? How are you on time? No problem. I have time enough. Perfect. I, uh, I, I reserved that, uh, until like one and a half hour more. So. Beautiful. And we appreciate that really tr truthfully. This is great. And what a surprise. 
uh, to my students and to everybody here, I had no idea about this potential project in Mexico. And it's so close to us that this is really fantastic how things align, France. Okay, uh, our next question is from Gilberto. Hi, friends. First of all, I would like to say it's a pleasure to have you with us. And I would like to thank you for all the information you just shared from your presentation. Now, um, you mentioned that there is a large partnership at MVRDB. And as we can see, each project has its own personality. I think we can attribute that not only to the site and the concept, but also to the people working on a project. So I would like to ask you, how do you determine which out of all the partners that work at MVRDB will work on any given project? Um, if you look at the organization of MVRDV, it, uh, MVRDV Rotterdam is actually, uh, it's not split, but we have like, say, eight studios inside the office. Um, and my studio at the, mo current, uh, at the moment is uh, concentrating on uh, projects in the Netherlands, as my home country, America and uh, South America. Uh, but we also have uh, one team that's only doing French projects. We have a project, a team that's only doing German projects. Um, so a lot of these things are geographical orientated. Uh, there's a lot, we have a large Asian studio of uh, 50 people here are just working on Asian uh, projects. Um, but we also have, for example, an urban studio. So they do, they work all over the world on bigger urban scale. And uh, uh, they, are, they, they do a lot of studies at the moment, for example, in resilience. And how do you make cities resilient against climate change? Uh, that's one of the big topics that, they, that, that we are studying at the moment. Uh, and there's also a, 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 a studio that, that is doing a lot of public buildings, or now, uh, not uh, no, uh, say highly commercial buildings. For example, the, um, uh, they, they work with uh, Gucci and these kind of, uh, they, they, uh, of Chanel. Uh, so it, it, it is a bit ge geographically, and sometimes it's um, because a partner has a connection. Uh, this, this project that I'm doing in Mexico is because I did a lecture uh, a, a couple of years ago and I met somebody and that now it turns into a project. So there's a personal connection with that partner. So the partner has to kind of be involved because that's the, where the client comes from and that client yeah. wants to hear from that partner. And then something that's really interesting that you just mentioned, Franz, because can you, can you talk a little bit more about this? Because, okay, that's how a partner is selected. That's where the project came through. It came through such and such partner. So that partner is in charge. But yeah, 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 yes, no, because it all, it also sometimes it also means uh, um, I also sometimes uh, shift projects, projects that come in, uh, and then I think, oh, that's um, it's a skill that doesn't fit me at the fit me, that, so that it's, it's too big. Or too, uh, then I would I, I would move it to another partner that that fits better with this or has more affinity at that moment. It could also be that um, time wise, it's a problem. Because yeah, we also we want to make sure that we have spend enough time on the project so that the quality is good enough. Uh, but yeah, it, it basically it, it comes in via uh, PRBD. Hey, Jan, you know Jan Knikker. Uh, mm. So projects come in via that, but also a lot via personal connections. And that, that, that of course, if it's true personal connections, it normally stays with the person that uh, has the connection. So that's the first step at the partner level. But then, as you mentioned, you have your, your studio, people working with you, and there's several studios like for several partners. That I'm really interested in, and I think that would be very useful for our students to hear. Do you see uh, the office environment at MVRDB to operate similar as sort of an architecture program or faculty, uh, sorry, academy, where you have faculty members and they give their studios and classes and they teach how to design the way they were taught or they believe should be designed. And so you have these sort of ecosystems and you can take class with the person that makes pizza or the person that makes sushi and you have to choose, no? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, uh, you see, especially uh, at, at the, the, say, the, the entrance level of MBS or the, the, the architects, the, the designers, they shift easily between studios. Um, but what we try, of course, that, uh, and that's also why Winnie, Jakob, Natalie are still very involved in all kinds of projects. We try to make sure that 
there is a coherent voice because uh, a lot of the projects that I showed today are not are, are not projects that I worked on. The green projects is projects that I'm extremely proud of, but it's not a project that I worked on. But it's a, it's an MPRDV project and it has the DNA of MPRDV, and that's the idea of course that it's everybody who's working and and also in the partner level has the M DNA of MPRDV and makes an MPRDV project. So it's it's uh, and, and and in school it's different because there you have somebody who who tells you um, I work like this and I think this is uh, and I think this and this is important and if you have a French teacher you should always look at uh, Le Corbusier because that's his uh, that is his most uh, his inspiration uh, inside our office it should be of course there are differences because there I'm not the same person as my other partner but in the end we all work, it's MP, we work for MPRDV. Yeah, I think the DNA and the philosophy is very clear from the outside, which is what makes yeah. it interesting to understand that there are different groups that even though fall within this overall philosophy might have some individuality and it might take yeah. a finer eye to be able to realize, oh, that's this partner's influence within MBRDB, even though it is part of, of course, the DNA of MBRDB. That's clear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our next question comes from Daniela. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you, friends. We really appreciate the opportunity to have you here and hear your lecture. Um, I was wondering, what is the path to be followed to be able to become a partner or member on MBRDB? Oh, uh, in my, yeah, I can only speak for myself. I've been, I've, I've been a long time at MBRDV. Uh, I started M MBRDV when the office was was with like 10 people or even less at that moment uh, so i really grew in it and every time i thought i'm going to, when i leave the office they had so a fantastic project for me uh, you should do this or you should do that so every time i took steps inside the office and at uh, now already uh, what is it eight years ago or five years ago they asked me do you uh, can you please become partner or do you want to become partner in our uh, in our uh, office so that's um but what, yeah, so it is um, being part of the office, understanding, uh, and that's good for every uh, office, understanding the DNA, the design philosophy of the office that you work for. Um, and uh, also, uh, partly, of course, it has to do with um, how can you, um, uh, how do you, how do, a big part is also bringing in projects and uh, uh, making sure that there is a continuity of, because uh, yeah, one of the big things, of course, I mean that it's a big monster. This uh, uh, that that needs to be fed with new projects, uh, so that everybody is still busy. So that yeah, that's all part of this whole process of becoming, and that is something that you learn slowly. Uh, the first uh, you, the first years inside an office is just about learning how the process works because you're at school and there you learn to be uh yeah they prepare you how to design how to be mentally prepared to work in an architectural office but then when you're in an architectural office you need to learn how to work inside this office in the teams that you have inside the office how it works uh, the, the the environment at a certain moment when you grow to a uh, to another level you need to learn how to handle and they take care of your clients and but also not lose the idea that you have hey, because a client has ideas but yeah especially as architect we need to surprise him with our ideas huh? uh, he can ask i want to have a house but yeah if he already knows what he's getting why should he ask you you should come with a different answer than uh, than he is expecting and maybe it's uh it's actually a better answer than he was expecting from you uh, and that is something that you also need to learn. And how do you handle your clients? And, uh, and that is the whole process that you go through before you, uh, at a certain moment, can be asked to become partner. Uh, so that's time, which is very important. I think as young people, as young persons, we all, when we're younger, have this eagerness to get things fast, right? So it takes time. It takes learning. As you said, listen to this, students. The first couple of years, that's two years at a studio, you're just learning how the studio works. And Franz mentions office working. That also means it's a bit of a dirty word, but it's a reality. Politics. What are the politics of a studio? How does a studio function? And then dealing with your client. 
you're not only just designing inside a team, you're designing in that team for a client. So all these things have to do with how a, a large studio, MVRDB, 270 uh, employees, that, as you mentioned, France, is a monster. It's a huge studio for this type of design, right? Because we sort of assimilate large uh, architecture office sometimes to be more corporate, right? But as we can see from the projects, the design ethos and DNA is, is as strong as, as ever. Um, I'd like to pass on to the next question. Uh, Raquel? Yes. Hi, Vance. Um, thank you a lot for your time today. Um, my question is regarding the Marmamop Reveal Rocks installation, this one. And yeah. I saw you were one of the partners in charge. And I read that the Verona Stone Fair in 2017 lasted only four days, which seems like a short amount of period for that much, but all that work. And I wanted to know what was done with the whole installation after that, whether it was moved or reused or even dismantled. Um, actually, what you see uh, behind you, these, it's, a, it's a loose structure. So there you see the column inside and there all the marble slabs are just moved around it. And uh, for the rest, it's just, there's, no, there, there's nothing fixed. Um, so they dismantled it and actually uh, took it back. And uh, they also reused it a couple of times in other fairs. So we made the design for this fair, but they, um, they, they got a price for it. Uh, so they, 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 they really fell in love with it. So they reused it. And I, and I don't know where it is at the moment, because of course, the last two years or the last year, there, there hasn't been any fair. Uh, but I know that they reused it a couple of times. Okay. But it's true, it was uh, the first time that they asked it, it was just for this four days. Thank you. Correct. Okay. Uh, Monse, you have a question. Yes. Hi, friends. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your time and your amazing presentation. And in the introduction, Viviano mentioned that you're currently leading projects in Netherlands, Switzerland, France, and the USA. So my question is, how is it like working with such different cultures and adapting to them at the same time? Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's one of the qualities of my work. That's what I love. That's what I love about my work is uh, working with different people, do, uh, discovering. Uh, I cannot wait to go to Mexico again. Uh, I love it to be there. I love to. Uh, I really love to go to the site to see the visit because it really helps me also to discover what we are going to do in this location, uh, to discover the people that live there and what they, they what their needs are and what they want. Um, it has been for an office like us, and it works because uh, we now all we have this Zoom meetings, we do Zoom presentations. Uh, I do projects via Zoom, uh, but it is that it makes it more difficult because um, a workshop normally when I come to when we have a meeting with a client, you have booklets out, you have things on the table. He reacts, we react. You, you take a pen, he takes a pen, and he, you start sketching on the on the plans. We all do that now in Zoom, and but it's different um, from. Uh, so I hope that uh, at a certain moment it becomes uh, possible to tra travel again and to see the different cultures again, because it's. I think that makes our work fantastic, and it uh, it also helps us to uh, broaden our horizon and to discover new things. And that's all you, yeah, we should always be curious to new things and new experiences because that helps us to discover new and make or make new buildings. Uh, perfect. I will pass on to our next question, which is Ana Paula. And uh, for my guys, if there's many other, any other questions, please let me know. If not, we're going to open up to the rest of the class according to times, uh, France time, of course. Ana Paula? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, friends. I really wanted to thank you for your time. I enjoyed hearing your presentation and all the analysis each building has behind. I was interested in knowing like which, stra which sustainable strategies do you look to apply on your projects? Um, it depends. It, it, uh, we try to, uh, what we at this moment are working, trying to be uh, inside, uh, we're working on the tool that calculates the CO2 uh, uh, 
production of our buildings and how can we make it, uh, how can we reduce it? But it also depends in which part of the world you are uh, working. Uh, at, at the moment, I'm working on a project also in Shanghai. We ex we try to, for example, there do a, a wooden canopy. That is something that they 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 just don't understand. They will not they will not do it. They will not think about it because they just don't understand. While in here in Europe, it is something there what, what you can. So so you always have to look at local circumstances. What can you do? How can you improve things? And how can you make the building as sustainable as possible? Um, and some buildings become extremely sustainable. Some, but, but we also not always communicate it. I don't know if you know the balancing barn that we did in. Uh, it's a holiday home in in in, in uh, close to London that we made. It's a very sustainable building, but it's not the most important thing of the building. It, the, the the whole idea behind the building is much more important. Uh, and yeah, of course, we make sure that it's as sustainable as possible. Um, but we, we're, try, uh, we're trying to be, uh, think about it, uh, or yeah, it's one of the things that is in all the designs that we do. It's one of the topics that we always discuss, how we can we improve it. Uh, but also realistically, I also have clients that, um, that I need to convince about this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do a, a project in Boston where it's a low rise building and it would be perfect for CLT, uh, for CLC structure. But the client has no experience with this. So we need to tell him and we need to convince him on how, uh, what this will do for his building and how does it work and what are the uh, benefits of it? And not only for him, but also for the people that are going to live there. Um, so that's, one of the roles that we also now have at our architect is to convince everybody actually that what we're doing that we need to change this whole uh, construction industry and it's and and but that's the one of the hardest things that you can do because it's a very very slow moving and slow changing industry and of course uh, <laughs> energy consumption all these kind of things are, are important to think about but it's that's that's the basics. That says something that everybody does and then they needs to do. But the next steps, that's the really the difficult part. And that's the one that takes the most time. Franz, I have the last question from my group, from my guys. And it's a question that comes from the whole group, actually. But Anna Sofia is going to ask it. Anna Sofia? Yes. Um, how can we apply to work in MVRDB or be part of the team? Ah, um, no, uh, I, I don't know if you, uh, as, as an intern or as a, as a colleague. Now, there, as an intern. Ah, uh, now we have two times a year, we have uh, around 26 to 30 interns. Actually, uh, next week, we have 30 new interns coming into our office because um, we think it's really important to work together with interns. Uh, they stay with us for six months. Uh, um, we think it's beneficial for everybody. The people learn a lot, uh, and also even in the this last months where most of the people have to work out, we made sure that we still had interns in our office. Uh, there is HR at MPRDV, or if you go to our there, our homepage, there is a a link where you can click, and uh, uh, we're always looking for good good interns. You're always welcome. And actually, it, it's really it's it's easier for an intern actually to get a uh, for Mexico to get into a Holland than for uh, somebody who just wants a job because then I that's the more difficult process. But for an intern, it's easier. Yes, to give a little bit more background to all of our students, uh, internship programs are at offices such as MBRDB are programs. These are established. It's not you know just any sort of random position. So it's a program for a certain type of student at a certain, uh, let's say, year of their studies to then take six months off their studies to then work in an office such as MBRDB. There's a set uh, compensation, set hours and everything. So look into the MBRDB website, prepare your portfolio if you have, if you're that fourth year, year out studio, sorry, student, and then you can apply, of course. Um, and and my, what, my I can, what, I, what, what I can say is that, um, 
And I and that goes for actually the whole MQRTV is when you we we don't see you as an intern. You directly become part of a studio. You become directly become part of an uh, uh, of a project team. So you really are going to wear. It's not that you that we move you inside the model shop and you're only doing models. Uh, for example, the intern that is starting next week in my team, he's really going to start directly on a project uh, in the United States. Uh, and he's going to, uh, I know that he's quite good in Revit at the moment. He's going to work with the team on the design of a, of a housing complex there. Actually, that's a great point. And I like to just say in the chat room, because our questions are done from our group in the chat room and mm -hmm. el chat jóvenes, si tienen preguntas. Pueden empezar a decir quién quiere hablar y yo les doy, leo su nombre y pueden hacer su pregunta. Okay, you guys can uh, say who wants to ask a question and I'll give you the mic uh, so you can ask your question. But Franz, you mentioned Revit and that was a question that we were talking about this week in studio. Uh, for interns, let's say, uh, what are the uh, software that you guys are using at the moment because... Uh, as you go back in time at different periods of time, studios are using different softwares, you know, yep. CAD, Rhino, then plugins, Revit, et cetera, model making techniques and like physical models. What are the softwares that you, or the skills that you look for in a intern? Um, I, first of all, uh, looking at in the background of me, model Blue making phone. is still one of the things that we do. And that's, uh, that's, that's always, uh, and it can be in blue foam, it can also be carbon. That's something that we always keep on doing because we think that's an integral part of our design. And it's something, and it's of course also 3D printing at this moment. We uh, 3D print a lot of models, but it's just nice to put on the table when you're with your client and discuss it. And it gives a direct presence. Um, so that's something that we always do. But if you look at software, one of the, um, and then in the architectural studios, that, uh, that's then the, for you the most important, Rhino is still one of the big tools that we use. And the other big tool is, and that because it, that it's it saves so much time, is Revit. And of course, the Adobe uh, Illustrator Photoshop, that's all, in, but Revit and Rhino are the, 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 the go to tools in, uh, in our studio. Perfect. Uh, yes, Revit, Rhino, and Adobe, including InDesign for crafting presentations, Illustrator diagrams. Uh, if you guys see Franz's uh, presentation, which you guys will be able to go back in the recording and see over and over again, look at all the beautiful diagrams to explain projects, right? And of course, hand sketching. Sometimes it's way faster than creating an Illustrator diagram, but you need to be able to develop the, the hand technique. Okay, guys, uh, anybody from outside of my class that wants to ask a question, I see here Yaretsi. Yaretsi, si quieres prender tu cámara. Sí, aquí estoy. Uh, hi, friends. It's really nice to meet you. I really love your work and it's pretty amazing. I also love uh, most of all the shaping of your projects that they are like different from other ones. So my question is if you would like well, if we would like to make a different shaping building, like with curves or something like that, what is, what is that one tip that you can give us in order to make it happen? Um, how, you, how do you mean it? In the design process or in the build process? Uh, in both. Like in design, where we can make it and when we would like to build it, like uh, what we need to do or... I don't know. Uh, Franz, just to give a little bit more context there, uh, maybe I might be, think it might be helpful. In certain places, uh, in certain cultures, it's understood that anything that it's outside of a 90 degree angle is complicated to design and it's complicated to build. So if I can paraphrase that question a little bit, not only tips on how to actually designing it, but how to convince someone of that design, both in the design process and then in the construction process. Um, I can say it's not a certain cultures, it's in most cultures. Also in Dutch, <laughs> we have a saying and it's yeah. a rond is rond and that actually means everything that has a curve is shit. That's, a, that's how a contractor sees it. So everything that you do outside the norm will always take extra convincing. And sometimes uh, you need to be uh, sharp. Um, 
I didn't show uh, Red 7, but that's a uh, building that we are building at the moment in Moscow. It looks really complicated. Um, you can see it on our, it's called Air Red 7. It's, um, it's, it looks really like a complicated building, but actually the structure that is behind it is really simple. Um, that's the same with um, the market hall. Huh? There's this curve, that, 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 the one that I showed the, with the big uh, mural inside, this curved building. We use a Dutch uh, building technique and it's called uh, a, a, a table uh, uh, form where you, it's a table shape where you pour concrete on and then you can actually move them every time. And we moved it every time so that it had a small cantilever and that created the shape of it. And, then, and only the top then we had to support at a certain moment to, to make sure that we could close the arch and then it became a stable structure. So you need, if you want to do something special, you need to do so. You need to be smart about it. Um, how can I make it in a smart way so that I can, that I can convince my client that it's actually not that hard to do? Because it always looks difficult. But if you then can tell him, no, no, you think it's difficult, but look, we can do. If we do this, this, and this, we get what we want. But it's actually something that's standard and that we always use. So that also means that if you do uh, projects like um, we do, but also OMA, uh, I know uh, your teacher worked for search and also there they did it. You need to do something extra. Uh, so you cannot just make your standard drawing set. You, during the process, you need to convince your client, look what we're doing. It looks difficult, but actually, or it, uh, it is something that we are, have on the control and we can do it in a, in a way so that it, it doesn't, because uh, they're always afraid of extra costs or extra delay. So, but it's, it's something that we can control. And as long as you can convince your client of that and you can convince the contractor of that, and that, that takes extra time and extra effort, um, then, you get, then you can make this, but it's, it's just, uh, yeah, time and effort from an architect. Uh, that reminds me of a competition that we did here at, at my office <laughs> once. We unveiled during the presentation, the competition model. And the client was really happy with the design and had a couple of cantilever in boxes. And after they have had eyed the model for 10 minutes and they were all like, okay, how are we going to build these cantilevers? We handed out to the 10 client representatives Legos. And we're like, here, look, build your own uh, model again with the Legos so they could understand how things click together. And then actually take something that looks complicated, but explain it in a simple way to not, to only, not only understand the design, but how it's built is, I think, what you're saying, right? Yeah. Uh, and, that, and, and that's as, literally what we did with the Red 7. We presented the building and during the presentation at the moment, I opened the Revit model where I just showed that all the walls inside the building were just simple concrete uh, walls with little cantilevers. So everybody who was on the engineering side was like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> and that's nice. important because then half of the questions are done because they were like okay i'm going to, how how are we going to pay this and how and the water tightness and the cut but then they saw okay wait structure is already simple so there's only now it's a facade problem you know, it, it 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 helps people to go see oh, okay we can do this why not i think friends that's also a key in explaining the concepts of the buildings trying to explain not trying to make a, comp, a, comp, a building look very complicated in its idea but explaining the most straightforward and simple way so that the client can understand what this building is about right yeah i've heard a, a teacher say uh confusing people doesn't make you an artist true now like it, 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 i uh, because i kept my uh lecture a bit compact this time because i wanted to show a bit more pre but uh, maybe there's time uh, next time when I'm uh, when I'm around to say do a longer presentation on one project where I can explain, for example, with diagrams and how we actually communicate something like this to a client. That we can definitely plan for that. We'll 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 keep that discussion, Franz. Thanks for offering that. Uh, we've got two more questions. Let me see, and then I think we can start to wrap up. Um, we've got Ana Sofia Villanueva. Well, hi, Franz, and thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really, really good. And I've got two questions, but they are small. The first one is, if you were to make an expansion of any building, 
what would you consider the most important starting point for its design? And I'll wait for the second question or I can say. Uh, I think you can that. ask it. I think it's okay, okay to ask both. The second is what do you expect from upcoming generations of architects? Mm, good. That's uh, the, the second one is a very nice one. Uh, the first one is um, the most important thing is actually, and um, what is the question that is, is asked? An extension of a building is, it's mostly not just an extension because what is this going to be inside the extension? How does it function? Where does it need to be related to the old building? Uh, is this a house and I need to just do an extension of the living room? That's quite simple, but it needs to connect to the living room. But if it's an extension of a museum, but it needs to integrate somewhere, where does it somehow fit? And how do you want to make it fit? And does it then mean that it needs to attach to it, or do, do you want do you do you somehow uh, make something out of it that it has gets an extra function instead of just the extension of this exhibition, for example? And 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 then that's of course uh, as a student that's more difficult, but as an architect, what what I find really important is having the conversation with my client. Uh, finding out what he wants from this. Uh, what is his idea behind it and how can I help him to reach this or actually exceed this uh, goal that he has? And the second and question the second was... One, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, you go first. Well, the second question was, uh, what do you expect uh, in new generations coming out of architecture schools? <laughs> the most important thing is to stay curious. Um, and that's, that, that goes not only for our sector, but that goes for all young people. Be curious about what's happening around it, uh, you. Uh, and of course, as a new generation, uh, we expect you to be uh, fluent in, the, new, in the, 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 the program. But that's with the program, you only uh, make something. It's a tool. It's your brain that you need to use. And it's your curiosity. And it's your... Um, uh, uh, the, the ideas that you need to generate, uh, and that comes out of curiosity and, and being being uh, optimistic about the future. I think that's uh, the most imp <coughs> important. Franz, uh, uh, our campus, which you may see in some of the people here in the Zoom's uh, profile photos, has a building by Talando, and I heard once Talando in a lecture say, Curiosity is a sign of uh, youth. Uh, once you stop being curious, you become old. And I thought that was a very nice uh, kind of way to, yeah, to phrase I it. I, I fully agree with him. Okay, we've got a question from Daniela Garcia. Sorry, no, no, no. Daniela Avila, then Angela Garcia. Sí. Well, first of all, thanks, friends, for all your presentation. It was awesome. My first question is, how do you maintain your essence throughout all your projects? Keeping in mind that all of them are so different and unique, how do you keep your essence in all of them? And do you ever worry that it might get lost in the design process? Oh, uh, um, that's, a, that's a constant worry. Because um, the... It's only rarely that I build what I what what I what my first design is. Uh, sometimes you make an, uh, a competition, you do an, uh, and, and you deliver it, and but only once every ten you really build this. During the whole process, uh, buildings get uh, there's a financial problems. There are uh, the, the client changes his mind. The, uh, so. It's always a struggle to keep the essence, but it's something that if you make sure and that's um, that this DNA of your office is there, and that I think that is really in MPRV, and that's why we have these teams so that people work longer on projects, stay longer at uh, MVRDV, feel welcome in MVRDV. Um, so everybody is part of this whole design process. Uh, that's how you say try to guard that the essence and the concept of the project stays there. Um, but yeah, to uh, to be honest, it is sometimes a struggle and it's sometimes a really a fight to make sure that the pro the project stays or uh, stays in the boundary that you want. And it's not always going to be as good as 
you want in the beginning. Um, uh, cause, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it is something that you need to, to uh, always guard and fight for. Franz, I'd like to add a couple of comments there because we're wrapping up. We have the two last questions and we're done. So the next questions are uh, Angela and Maria, and they're gonna, we're going to finish with Maria. But I, from what you mentioned, I, I, it brings to my mind two things. One is going back to the discussion about you know, fighting to keep your project the way it's originally conceived, right? So the word fight connected with me. When we were talking about the internship programs, and you said you know, you're going to really be working with the team. Uh, you're not going to be like, you know, preparing coffee or tea and stuff like that. But I think also what that means and having worked in Dutch studios, search and, and OMA, um, an intern, the hierarchy disappears within the team. Yes, there is a hierarchy. There's project leaders and there's seniors and there's juniors and architects and interns. But in the end, what I've found at Dutch studios, which are the ones that I've worked at, is that it's a fight for the best idea. So in the end, it's always about the best idea. It doesn't matter who it comes from, Right. Um, and that's also a discussion that the partner should have. So different partners will have different ideas and then they're put on the table and you make models and what's the best idea. Now with this discussion, what you were saying about the fighting to keep your project as originally conceived, I, the other day I was giving people a tour through a project that's under construction and it was like step-by-step step, like, oh, that was originally planned like this, but then this changed. And so then we did that. And then it's like 20, 30 things that evolved in design or in construction for X or Y reasons that have nothing to do with the architect. However, I think the way you framed your presentation, you've, you mentioned it twice. It's about what is the question in the project? And not only what is the question, what's the most interesting or perhaps most pertinent question? When the whole project is designed around that, then the changes don't matter because at the end, you're still trying to solve the biggest, most important, most interesting problem. And I think the DNA in MBRD follows that, no? Yeah, no, that's uh, what you said. It, it, it's always a process. Uh, and it's not the client, but also the, with the contractor. Uh, that what you said, there's sometimes small changes that have a huge impact, but you always, every change, if it's within the boundaries of the idea that you have, it doesn't matter. And you always then, okay, if we do this, that means that I have to do this, this, and this, so that it still fits. Um, and that is something that is, that is, that is what I said. That is to say the fight to make sure that you, uh, you don't just say, say, okay, then we change it, but then say, okay, if we need to change this, that has an impact on this, this, and this, so that the building still is, uh, still stays, stays there and the concept still stays there. And because, the worst thing that you can do is accept it. And then in the end, the client says, yeah, you're, you're right. We should have done it differently. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that overarching theme, that uh, important question is there to help you guide you with yeah. the changes because okay, like, we can make changes, but we need to keep solving that, that, that question. The problem relies when there's projects that get built that have no underlying question or challenge or concept really and then then anything change is possible because they they're not aligned to solving the problem or the question no. right uh, if, if the if the, my client asked, uh, i'm now in boston where i'm doing we're doing a housing project and the, they really ask us to to come with the influence of dutch housing to the american market and to try to develop really a, 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 a compact but fant a fantastic uh, apartment if this is the goal uh, and you keep this as the goal, it doesn't matter that sometimes things change or that, so you know, no, we want to, now we want to go from stick builds to a uh, steel building or that's a structural change. And of course it has impact on the wall thicknesses, but it's still the idea that the apartment that I make have a different layout are the best uh, as possible. So every time if you do something, you just go back to this question. Is this still the best apartment that we're making? Exactly. Precise. Okay, Franz, we're going to wrap up with the last two questions um, and then we'll conclude. I've got Angela Garcia, who is, I know, because she's the next student of mine, from Saltillo as well. Angela? Hi, Franz. I'm so glad to meet you and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for your time, first of all. And, well, I'm so excited for the project in Saltillo because I'm from there, as Viviana said. And well, I have two 
I have two questions. I think both are very simple. But the first question is, which is your design process? Which is the first thing that you think of when you're designing to the last thing you think? And let's add uh, the second question already. Uh, let's put them together, Angela. OK, and the second question is, I see that you have this in your office, these colored rooms. And my question is, how do you make people keep concentrated there? Because here in Mexico, in our classrooms, we barely have windows because we get, we don't pay attention if we have like windows or if we have a lot of color. So how do you maintain people concentrated in your office that you have this pop of color? Um, now yeah, the, the workspace is actually quite neutral. That's this why the white space that I showed. Um, and what, uh, what I told, we have different studios uh, and in this project, the studios, we have projects, of course. And what we do is actually um, at least once a year, all studios change location inside the office. So everybody, including me, including all our stuff, needs to move to another location in the office. Uh, that also means that you need to clean your stuff and you need to, clear, uh, to get rid of all the stuff that you don't need uh, that that you don't need anymore. But that also means that then the whole project teams are close together again and can work together. Um, and um, so that that is one of the things that we make sure that people sit together, work together, and can have conversations together. And another thing, of course, is that, uh, yeah, like in a lot of offices, we have headphones. We have, uh, have so people are just with noise cancelling headphones uh, concentrating because they have to do, I don't know how many plans in a Revit uh, file. Um, these, are the, yeah, these are the tricks that everybody uses uh, all around the world. We also use them. Do you have a, uh, you have a canteen at MVRDB? People have lunch at, at, at the office, at least pre COVID. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that, this, uh, look, we have a large wooden table. Uh, that where everybody has lunch at the same at, at between twelve and two, uh, you can well, you can sit there and uh, and uh, and have lunch together. And the idea is also that you that it's one table is that you meet then the people from the other studios so that, so that you don't sit next to your colleague but you sit somebody against the agent studio and have a discussion about what they are doing, which project they are working on, so that you. Feel and also, where and another thing that we do also is um, because we want to make sure that we, we keep on working as one studio. We have, uh, you know, the TEDx, uh, the TED uh, talks, huh? the, yes. the, the 10 slides. We do that also in our offices so that every studio and it always needs to be the youngest person of the, of the team. So if you're an intern in their office, you do a presentation in front of the whole office of the project. Uh, so every month we have. 10 or 12 projects that are going to be presented by the, the, people, the people from the studios to make sure that everybody can comment on them and that everybody knows what's going on and which projects are there and in which phase they are uh, to keep this, yeah, to keep this uh, close, tight, knit uh, group together. This, this guys, is really like Dutch office culture, Dutch architecture office culture. Uh, you get to walk past the tables. Each table is a team. And you can go in there and ask, well, what are you guys working on? Like, oh, we're working on this competition in Morocco. We're working on this competition, so and so. But because everybody's focused on their own projects, then these sort of lectures that are informal, sort of like Pecha Kucha style, also, France, like, you know, really yeah. quick and maybe with drinks and it's after office hours or maybe during lunch, I don't know, depending on each office, then the whole office can see what other people are working on and, as Francis, comment on. And that's really necessary. I remember at OMA, uh, all of a sudden at meetings, Rem might bring in someone from outside of the team, and it could be from outside of the office, uh, a random person. And if that person makes a comment and it's a good one, it changes the project. It's good to have these outside influences of people who are not directly involved with the project. It's like when you're rereading your essay that you're writing, you need to see it with fresh eyes constantly, right? Okay. Uh, and I said, we do the dispatch coaches. Uh, the idea is then that, that the youngest member of the team presents the project. Mm -hmm. So it's not me presenting the project because I know how to present it. But it's nice, of course, that somebody else actually that's working on this project from their standpoint pre presents it. So that you see if it's actually what, we co what I communicate is that they also see it in the same way and that the whole idea. And of course, it's a good teaching moment also because, yeah, uh, it's somebody who I do a lot of presentations to my clients. Uh, but they don't. So it's also a teaching moment uh, then for the, this, this person. 
Yeah, to know how to present, which is a, a, yeah. a skill in itself. That's beautiful. And that's a very MBRDV way. I also like the trick. I, I, that one I hadn't heard of before, the moving places. Because, of course, then it becomes stale and then you start to accumulate stuff around your place, right? <laughs> that's yeah. great. Okay, last but not least, we've got the last question for this session. Remember uh, to everyone here that we'll have France again in December. Hopefully, potentially, maybe even at some point physically, let's see how things go both for France's side and our global pandemic side. Yes. Um, I've got Maria Fernanda Sandoval. Yes, thank you. Hello. I wanted to know what would you recommend us or what tips would you give us to design a building that extends out from the rest of the ones in the place, but at the same time keeps the essence of this place? Uh, ooh, um, you kept you kept the diff most difficult question for last. <laughs> <laughs> context, uh, context going yeah. against or with context. Yeah, um, actually, the context normally also somehow gives this. Um, if the uh, if this is in a uh, low, low, very busy location. The location. I think the, the project that, that I showed in Seoul, where, where the imprint, that was almost a con contextual, where no context, there were the, in the middle of this industry, we needed to build, do two buildings with no facades. How do you do that? Yeah, we use there the context to actually create our facades, create the buildings. Um, in this case, in your case, uh, it depends. I don't know the location around it. I don't know uh, how it looks, but there is a very strong building already. And it's what I said, it's the narrative that you're going to have with this building. And how do you want to treat the building? Uh, that, that is going to be the, the, the interesting. So it's really about the story that uh, one of the most important things about architecture and one of the most important things about um, projects is the storytelling. So which, what story is your uh, addition going to tell in relation to this uh, existing build, building? Architecture is a lot about storytelling. Exactly. So think about this. What, what is the story in December that you can tell me why did you do this? It's not and just because it's beautiful. There's an idea behind it. It's a, and, 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 and a story that you can tell. And we'll, I'll provide you, Franz, with uh, the context analysis for the building so that you're uh, prepared for when we have that studio review. Uh, my students, the first exercise we do is they watch a film, a complicated film, and then they have to create one diagram that tells the story of the film or at least something interesting within the film. And we see a lot of like Christopher Nolan complicated films, uh, Memento or you know, Interstellar. Oh, that's we just did for the first time this semester, Tenet, which is extremely complicated. Uh, and it's about that. And I'm saying this because I, I, I sound sometimes like a, par a parrot repeating stuff. It's about telling a story with one drawing and it's complicated, it's not easy. You need to develop that skill of both the drafting of the drawing, the idea behind the drawing and the storytelling of that drawing, right? So it's amazing that you mentioned that, uh, Franz, and I appreciate it. Well, and, and, and this is maybe one of the most important lessons because this is how you get your audience and that can be your client, that can be the city, that can be every, to go with you and to accept the building that you're designing. They also want to know, why did you do this? So it's all about the storytelling. And this is one of the, the, the big things that you need to practice and that you need to, uh, uh, um, yeah, what you said, it, I, I think it's fantastic how you do it. Create one image about a, a film it's, uh, or one diagram. It's, it's a very good uh, teaching uh, exercise. Fantastic. And it's, it's tricky because everybody likes watching a movie as an assignment, but then it's really difficult to actually go about and doing the drawing. Uh, actually, I think we have a faculty member here within the, um, within the Zoom, uh, Marcelo, who was a professor of mine when I was sitting. And he started that idea in me. He gave that exercise and I took it forward with my students and it's evolved a little bit, but it comes from him. And actually, Marcelo, he worked in the UK with, uh, I forgot now his name, uh, with, that, with Alsop and with Marcelo, okay. going back to 
how there's different studios within the academy. And, you know, you learn this with this person, you learn that with that person. With him, I learned all about diagrams and it got me very much involved with diagrammatic architecture. You know, let's say the, the Philharmonic, sorry, not the Philharmonic, the um, Holocaust Museum of Libeskin as an example of, you know, a building being formed yeah. from a set of lines that have meanings. But the meaning that what I'm saying is that we used to make uh, a little bit fun of that class was how to explain the unexplainable with a diagram. And I think that's key with what you're saying to explain your projects in a very simple way with one very compelling image, which many a times it's easier to do that with a diagram than let's say a render. They're both in a way yeah. images, right? Uh, I didn't show many of them, but the concept sketch and actually the concept diagrams is an integral part of MPRV design. When I present to my client uh, concept diagrams, concepts, and it's not always one, it's normally actually, uh, we normally make a small range of like six diagrams that tell the story. Uh, here we started and this, and that's why we can, this, uh, here we end. And then that turns into the building. It's an integral part of our uh, design uh, strategy. Fantastic, Franz. This has been amazing. We're very excited already to have you back in December and to uh, send you the result of our case studies. A lot of this is also going to be self-answered because students need to then dive into all of the MVRDB project and say, well, how did MVRDB respond to this context? Like, for example, the glass uh, facade for the shop in Amsterdam. Or how did MVRDB resolve this context? What was the conversation? What were the problems to solve for the topics? So really looking forward to that. Really appreciate your time. Franz, you have my students, if you want to say your final final uh, message, and then I'm going to ask you to stay on board. The students will, will leave, and I'll get to say thank you again in private. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I would just want to thank you all for your uh, very nice questions, and I'm really looking forward uh, seeing you again in uh, December and uh, seeing the result of uh, the project. Fantastic. Guys, okay, my students, we have a separate link for the postmortem. Everybody else, you can all say just thank you again and exit the Zoom room. Thank you so much. Thank you, friends. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, friends. Thank you, thank have you nice friends. Day. Have a good day. All right, almost all out. Let me stop the recording as well, Franz. There we go, recording stopped.